On this episode of the Young Pioneer Podcast, we bring you the first in a three-part series from the field in the Horn of Africa, one of Africa's most beautiful and geopolitically complex regions. Tourist season has reopened in Socotra with in and outbound flights changing to Cairo in 2024. We'll be back to South Sudan in November, and then we've got a classic YPT Tito's Yugoslavia tour scheduled for December. And last, but certainly not least, our least visited countries tour has finally returned. And we've got some educated speculation about North Korea reopening for tourism. All this and more on this episode of the Young Pioneer Podcast. Okay, so here we are, and it's the September 2023 edition of the Pioneer Podcast, and I'm your host, YPT partner and sometimes guide, Justin Martell. As I promised in the last podcast, I would do less talking and try to get right into our exclusive interviews with our travel partners whom we feature on the show. I'll start off by saying what you're going to hear is part one of a series of three interviews recorded during our recent YPT Djibouti, Somaliland, and Eritrea Horn of Africa tour. It is worth noting that the tour also did include Mogadishu, Somalia, but we opted not to interview our local partner in Somalia in order to keep our exact tour itineraries in Mogadishu discreet, as, though it is improving, the situation on the ground remains somewhat unpredictable and the security of our clients is our number one priority. Coming back, though, to what we are going to discuss today are some fascinating perspectives from our local tour partner in Djibouti, the Pearl of the Gulf of Tajura where our Horn of Africa tour kicked off. We met our group in Djibouti City, and pro tip, uh, because of the amount of foreign military bases in the country, drones are prohibited. If Djibouti Customs do take your drone when you enter, um, they will give it back to you when you exit the country. That did happen with a member of our group, and that transaction went very smoothly. After a night of exploring Djibouti City and a great meal at a Yemeni fish restaurant, we headed out for a night of camping at Lake Abe. Lake Abe is this amazing Martian landscape and a formidable sight as the surrounding area features the hundreds of natural limestone chimneys spitting out steam and sulfur. It's in the middle of the desert and about a six hour drive from Djibouti City, right on the border with Ethiopia, and it's accessible only by 4x4 vehicles. And it's considered one of the absolute hardest to reach places on Earth. Waking up on Lake Abe feels like waking up on another planet, and it was absolutely worth the trek out there. Before returning to Djibouti City, we spent our third day in Djibouti, heading out to and checking out another location which feels not of this earth, Lake Asal. It is the lowest point in Africa and the fourth most saline body of water on the planet. Then on our last night in Djibouti City, we went out for a wonderful dinner at a French restaurant and I interviewed our local partner, Daniel, about tourism in Djibouti and its future. So enough of me talking. Here is my interview with our local partner in Djibouti, Daniel. Okay, I'm standing here out in front of the La Siesta Hotel. Uh, here in Djibouti City, Djibouti, and I'm talking with Danielle Jean Bourgeois, who is our uh, local tour operator here in Djibouti. We've just completed a three day tour. This is country number one of our YPT Horn of Africa trip 2023. And uh, we've just uh, we spent a night out at Lake Abe, we saw Lake Assal, we were able to explore Djibouti City. Um, and so I just wanted to talk with Danielle. He's, uh, of course, uh, from Djibouti. Uh, he's very passionate uh, about his country, about his country's history, about its future. So let's begin. I think, you know, for a lot of listeners, I think, or a lot of foreigners in general, probably the most that they know about Djibouti is just about the foreign military bases that it has. There's a very large American military presence, Chinese, Japanese, and of course the French technically never left after 1977, right? There was a sort of some sort of cooperation agreement, so they still kept a military presence in Djibouti. I think that's probably what most foreign people would know. Tell us a little bit about Djibouti's history prior to um, the you know French uh, colonization, which started in 1883. Uh, okay, uh, Djibouti is uh, a, a new country. 
but you know the the beginning of Djibouti history started in Tajorra. It used to be a sultanate that existed since uh, five six centuries. So uh, due to colonization, so they moved from uh, uh, let's say uh, the northern part of Djibouti called Obok which was the capital, uh, colonial capital of Djibouti city. And then they moved to Djibouti city to found the city. I mean, it's a new uh, young city since we can say 100 years old. Uh, and But the city did exist, I mean, the country did exist also in uh, prehistoric time and pharaonic time when we talk about uh, some uh, pharaoh people who used to come to buy incense here but we just uh, focus on the colonial time and uh, yes uh, Djibouti uh, when it comes to tourism is an discovered uh, destination uh, as well as a little bit in the region and sometimes you know it's more challenging because it, especially in the beginning when I started this job people get used to French style. And I always try to tell them that, you know, most of the visitors are, are not from France. And maybe when it comes to the meal, they prefer to have a buffet, uh, either than uh, entree and then, uh, you know, French style. But for them, every tourist is the same. And now, fortunately, they get used to uh, to every kind of, uh, of people or every kind of nationality but still we still have uh, many things to improve of course uh, we focus more on military we invest more on military than on tourism because the tourism uh, require more uh, I mean roads hotels resort and we don't have it that like in Lacabe or like Asal we try uh, mostly to sell uh, the nature than the accommodations. And yes, uh, I will welcome everybody to come to Djibouti to see because it's full of challenging, uh, challenges and you need to be very strong and very also uh, patient when you visiting Djibouti. It's a wonderful country. I can give an example. Okay, Djibouti is 23. 1300 square kilometers exactly but in such a small country you have two special lakes uh, the day forest as well as a wonderful place for diving especially uh, in seven brothers we have the wild shark and when you compare to other countries you know when you cross the sahara the desert is maybe two three times Djibouti size and you have the same landscape but here you can see different kind of landscapes and but you know it's full of challenge now our prices are uh, visa price what used to be very expensive 90 dollars today it's about 20 i think 15 dollars so we try to improve we used to have very few hotels now we have more than before uh, and uh, we still have to improve many things, but it's a wonderful country to visit. So this is all about Djibouti. So don't think that is only military, of course, because we are in investing, because we are renting, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, some bases for militaries, but we are trying also to invest in tourism. And uh, we are not like Kenya, understand but we are the team who is doing its best to improve the tourism in Djibouti so and uh, I hope to see you guys and uh, coming more because most of people they think that is unsafe because when uh, they're related with the region we have Yemen Somalia Eritrea but Djibouti is 100% safe even when you get a place like Lakabe no militaries nobody's there so you can you can feel and 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 and, and you can see the safety of the country because this is the safety of a country depend on the people and Afar people are very peaceful
So, and uh, they are trying to keep the safety and the peace in the country, special, especially around like Assam and like Abe, and also maybe other parts in Djibouti. Yeah, and I mean, you've, you've obviously you've touched on a lot, um, and uh, there are some uh, very unique uh, natural sites, uh, you know, I guess for such a small country to have such unique uh, natural sites is uh, is fascinating. And let's just actually let's just talk about the the tour that we just did for the last three days, and we can kind of walk through it. So we landed, and uh, we settled in here at the uh, at the uh, Hotel La Siesta, which is uh, you know it's not a uh, it's not the Sheridan, but uh, it's certainly uh, I would say for regular YPT travelers, it's uh, absolutely perfect. And um, we took a tour of Djibouti City, so uh, we actually we did drive around. We we did drive past the military bases. No no photos, um, but we saw the uh, the old French uh, colonial. Was it is it the French? The French built the yeah, historical, uh, historical uh, downtown. Yes. So most of that area actually uh, is built by France and uh, founded by France somehow. And uh, yes. Uh, uh, you know, France has invested a lot also in terms of uh, economy uh, when it comes to the dollars is attached uh, with our currency and it doesn't change. And most of the buildings we see in the uh, European quarter are built during uh, colonization. And yes, when it comes to, tour to tourism, even to be honest with you, uh, we have some tourists, some people coming by a uh, ship just to uh, uh, how, how do you say, supply their boats so they remain two, three days. And when we take them to uh, a tour, they, don't, they didn't even know about Djibouti, never heard about Djibouti, but by accident, so they have to stop to supply their ship. So we take them on tour and they just surprised to see this country because they never thought that Djibouti was so beautiful because you know to be honest with you except the heat the rest is I can say wonderful the heat is a little intense but the experience certainly uh, makes it worth enduring the heat tell us a little bit more about the Djibouti city tour you know what people can expect so we saw the buildings built by the French uh, during the colonial period we saw the country's two largest mosques and we saw the colonial railway station just walk us through that if you can so our city is a colonial city is divided by, by African quarter and European quarter. So, and also the city is growing fast. Sometimes we reach the, uh, like uptown that used to be villages and also shanty towns, but now it's growing faster uh, thanks to uh, the local economy and we're hosting many militaries and people can get jobs and money so they can also build their own house by land and uh, yes Djibouti is mixed is a city port and is mixed between uh, like uh, uh, like I said uh, the European quarter and then the African quarter so there are two big difference between both when you visit you can understand uh, African is African but the European is where uh, the elite in that time and the, the French administration used to live. Of course, they had to build also proper things for them and for the administration. And uh, yeah, it's quite different than the Africa quarter, but the Africa quarter has more life. The real life of Africans, because when people come to visit Africa, they want to see the real life, not something that is really prepared or built or, of course, you have colonial history, I mean, uh, moni historical monument uh, related with the colonization. But you know, the most important thing is the market and also the, you know, the place we have been uh, for dinner, you know, is, is kind of people is more attractive for, I would say, most of my, uh, my client, I mean, tourists coming to Djibouti. And when I take them to uh, a restaurant 
in downtown, very beautiful. And they always said, we're not here for that. We'll be here to experience the real life. So that is the real life is in African quarter, but and that's and that's true. We uh, night number one, we had an amazing meal at a uh, Yemeni restaurant in the African quarter, and uh, uh, the fish was amazing, and it was a big hit with the group. And I think that you said that that restaurant is quite famous, uh, just in Djibouti city, right? In general, among locals too, right? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, actually, more by uh, uh, expat, the militaries since uh, now i would say 40 years and and, and that you know is a bit uh, expensive for local and the local they don't go where is the you know the military is the french because they cannot afford also the cost and that place is uh, mostly kept for military living in djibouti and uh, yes it's one of the famous r- restaurant in uh, for uh, you know in Djibouti actually we have two kind of dishes the Yemeni fish so this is famous for the Yemeni fish and uh, backed fish with naan and also some sauce salsa but we have also uh, daytime different meal and unfortunately it was not possible to experience that because uh, the time was short and we had to drive uh, uh, to the lake and uh, but we have what we call hanid hanid is a kind of caprito they call it in spanish and uh, yeah so uh, normally local people they don't have uh, a main dish because no lunch by local people they only have breakfast and lunch good lunch they spend the day in the desert so they don't have uh, lunch just breakfast and dinner yes the breakfast is also based on uh, what you had in the morning so it's especially that uh, pancake. yeah it was a uh, sort of a it was like a sweet naan almost but very much like a pancake pancake and kind of uh, let's say they use a lot of camel milk or goat milk so this is more nutritive and for them to also to survive in the desert but all they need uh, at daytime is water which is very important and then in the afternoon they go back uh, to home and to have also a good meal but not based on meat especially meat is very expensive they're not going to kill their livestock goats uh, to eat meat and occasionally but uh, when it comes to Yemeni fish is brought by Yemeni community living in Djibouti. The Hanid is a little bit uh, the specialty of the region. So when it comes to the local food, it's very hard to uh, describe that. You have to go home. We call it Skodah Karis. It's not really promoted at the restaurant. It's something that you can have it by Djiboutian family. And yes, of course, uh, for souvenirs or even we used to have this Kenyan and uh, East African souvenirs, mask and status, which is not the culture of Djibouti. But today, some shops are promoting the local uh, craft and souvenirs through associations, and they need a, a bit of time uh, uh, to develop that because you know we have a lot of first-time Africa like the militaries, for them being to Kenya or Djibouti or or South Africa is the same, it's Africa. So uh, they believe more on those uh, masks from Kenya or Senegal or Gambia, uh, because you know, local people, they start to promote uh, their own culture and craft recently. So that's why it's improving, I would say, compared to 10, 15 years ago, many things have improved. That's good that uh, Djibouti is uh, promoting its own unique identity uh, to tourists. Continuing our discussion about the tour itself, so then we, we had our, uh, our, our tour of uh, Djibouti city, uh, night one, amazing uh, Yemeni fish, and then the next day we uh, set out uh, across the country to the border of Ethiopia to Lake Abe. Uh, Can you tell me what makes Lake Abe unique and why foreigners uh, would want to visit Lake Abe? 
Okay. So Lacabe, to honestly, ninety uh, percent of my travelers, they are world world travelers, and uh, they said this is a unique place. What makes it unique is uh, is abstract. Is something that you know. Some people told me that these chimneys are also in Algeria, but they are in rocks, while here is in the atoms. So uh, I cannot describe the feeling of my clients because they are the one. Of course, the place is not hospi more hospitality, the heat, so the accommodation, but once you are there, it's wow. And uh, you know you have to pay the price for visiting Lacabe, especially when it's st you start the road. Like it's a challenging road that is not for everybody. You have to be very strong, and of course it's not very long. It's about 80 kilometers from the main road to uh, Lacabe. But uh, once you get there, of course the accommodation is a bit uh, challenging and sometimes you have these insects called uh, moucheron or matches and but you know once you're there is the price to pay to say this place which is unique according to 99 percent of my clients it's true and uh, yes the ride out there is a little challenging it's only 80 kilometers but it takes about five hours because a fair amount of the road is is off-roading i mean Okay, and uh, now we're actually, we, we got cut off last night. Uh, Daniel had some uh, uh, urgent business to take care of. We actually had to pick up two of our uh, packs uh, from the, who arrived late night at the airport. But anyway, let's resume. So as we, we were discussing, we, uh, Lake Abe is an amazing place. I mean, it's, it's a dead lake, right? No, there's no, there's nothing living in it. It's completely dead. And it's known for its uh, limestone chimneys, which are hot springs underneath that are pushing up the earth to create these wonderful chimneys. And we camped overnight, woke up at dawn to see the steam coming out of the chimneys. And uh, from there, we continued on to Lake Asal. Why, what makes Lake Asal unique? Okay, what makes Lake Asal unique is the colors and also the salinity, the quantity of salt in a small surface area. So the concentration concentration of salt you you have many places like like asal but the salinity the quantity of salt is very huge so what we call uh the bonkies which is the iceberg is about 80 meter uh, uh i mean thick and it, it is estimated between one and two billions of uh tons of salt so uh, it makes of like asal the biggest uh, deposit of salt in the world. Again, Lac Asal, what Lac Asal means is the honey lake. It used to be honey back in days when the value of salt used to be big, uh, huge, enormous. Today, the value of salt, uh, the salt has lost his value. And unfortunately, the people, they get, I mean, poor, they just uh, collect the salt. To They can't even sell it to buy... Uh, vegetables they just make a truck they exchange the salt with a vegetable uh, uh, ethiopian side so uh, they ask, this is the way how they survive but now they could find small jobs uh, because the chinese factory is there and uh, yeah they can they create some job uh, uh, jobs for some people and uh, yes what make like a cell unique is uh it is the lowest point in Africa and the third in the world. So if you visited Kilimanjaro, the highest point in Africa, and you come to Djibouti for the lowest point, uh, it means that you have done with all Africa. <laughs> so That's great. And I, th I think it's also the, um, the second saltiest body of water. It's actually saltier than the Dead Sea. Um, and I think it's second only to Don Juan Pond in Antarctica, I think. I would look it up. I'm going to double check, but I think that's the case. Um, anyway, so from there, we headed back to Djibouti City. We had uh, an amazing dinner at a French restaurant. On our way out, there was a variety of, I mean, it was an expansive menu, uh, wonderful seafood, grilled meats, rice, fries, etc. It was great. It was a really great way to wrap up our time and our first time in Djibouti. 
Anyway, Daniel, I want to thank you for all of your help and hospitality and for doing this interview and see you again soon. I thank you for visiting uh, Djibouti and I hope that you will come again with a, a bigger group, uh, but is, is more challenging, especially for the accommodation, but we can, we can make it. We can make it. We can uh, try a way to satisfy you guys. However, uh, the tour is challenging due to the heat, but you will survive. It's only we give you uh, the opportunity to experience nomad life for one day. So you will be nomad like us and you will forget, uh, I mean, the civilization. Just this is very important to live that, you know, in your life. So you will never get that home, but you have the chance to be a nomad at least for one night. Exactly. One of a kind experience. Totally worth it. Thank you, Daniel. And that was my interview with YPT's local partner in Djibouti, Danielle. He certainly had his hands full arranging the tour, and we appreciate him taking the time for the interview. Right after we wrapped the segment, it was off to Djibouti and Bouli International Airport, where we started to get into the very YPT locales of this particular tour as we headed to the unrecognized sovereign state, the Republic of Somaliland. Stay tuned for our next episode with my field recordings made during the unrecognized young country's independence day celebrations where we discuss the country's complex political history with our local guide at the head of the podcast i promised some ypt travel updates and here they are north korea there have been a number of erroneous reports that north korea has now reopened to tourism but this is not strictly true in fact north korea has partially reopened to foreigners subject to quarantine measures according to sources from within korea the government has announced that foreigners are being allowed back into the country subject to a 48-hour quarantine and test in the dprk in this context foreigners and tourists have been taken to mean one and the same embassy aid workers and business people have been either not allowed into the country or have faced quarantine measures of up to two weeks. So what does this mean for the reopening of North Korea to tourists? It means that things are moving slowly but surely in the right direction. North Korea has begun allowing delegations from China and Russia and most recently has resumed flights to and from the country with Air China and Air Korea. It was also announced in September that it would begin letting DPRK citizens who are living abroad to return home uh, as well as to leave North Korea. So this is something we can personally confirm has indeed happened. We see these developments as the latest in a series of slow but steady steps forward toward the country reopening to tourists. We expect that that won't happen until sometime next year, but always expect the unexpected when it comes to the DPRK. So to that end, please be sure to visit our website and sign up for our mailing list so you can get exclusive updates and be one of the first post-COVID travelers to the Hermit Kingdom. Sakatra. Our listeners will recall that two episodes ago, we recorded an episode on a spring trip to the island of Sakatra. If you've been following YPT for some time and are interested in unusual destinations, you're probably aware that Sakatra is a beautiful island situated between Yemen and Somalia, known for its endemic plant and wildlife. The windy season is now over and tourism has resumed with regular tours scheduled for October, November, December, January, March, and April. As I mentioned, starting in 2024, our trips to Sakatra will begin and end in Cairo with a stopover in Aden. Tito's Yugoslavia. Running from December 2nd through 13th and conveniently broken up into three groups, this tour visits all seven countries of the former People's Republic of Yugoslavia. Bosnia and Herzegovina, Croatia, Kosovo, Montenegro, North Macedonia, Serbia, and Slovenia. The Republic was led by the charismatic yet iron-fisted former partisan Josip Broz Tito until his death in 1980. Following Tito's passing, economic and political problems exploded into the full-blown Yugoslavia wars of the early 90s and the Republic's dissolution. I've spent a lot of time in the Balkans, and believe me, this is the best crash course in what might be the most geopolitically complex part of the world next to, I don't know, the Horn of Africa. Least visited countries, one month, 14 countries broken up into four groups. Because of their remote locations, some of the world's least visited countries, including Nehru, the least visited country in the world, are located in Oceania. From 2018 to 2020, YPT was the only travel company to offer the easiest and most affordable way to traverse these island paradises with virtually no other tourists in sight except, of course, your YPT friends. After a three-year hiatus, the least visited countries tour is back. 
Our inaugural return tour is running December 15th, 2023 through January 14th, 2024. And and though that tour is already totally full uh, due to popular demand, it looks like YPT may run the tour straight away again in February 2024. So if you miss signing up for the December, January trip, send us an email and we'll notify you as soon as we start taking bookings for the next edition of the tour. South Sudan. See it while it's still the world's youngest nation. YPT has been providing fully guided and security conscious tours of South Sudan for some time, and it's quickly becoming one of our most popular destinations. I think a lot of travelers see it as a country just to kind of tick off the list, but really our tours are a great way to experience the bustling atmosphere of the young country's capital, Juba, as well as a one-of-a-kind overnight camping experience with the Mandari people, a nomadic cattle herding tribe known for their care of their livestock, including, of course, Course, the uh, very famous uh, cow blowing and cow urine shower routines. Uh, you can experience all of this audibly by listening to our previous episode recorded on location in South Sudan. But anyway, uh, we're back to South Sudan November 25th through the 28th. Check it out. So doesn't all this travel talk make you want to actually go somewhere? I mean, remember, Marco Polo traveled from Venice to China, mostly on camelback, and his journey lasted nearly 24 years. Luckily, you don't have to save up 24 years worth of vacation days to travel with us to some of the most unique and hard to reach places on earth. So stop listening to me, visit youngpioneertours.com and drop us a booking inquiry. I'm Justin Martell and this has been another episode of The Young Pioneer Podcast.